Welcome everyone. This is the Lama Live weekly live stream event of Lama Soul Trim Alione. I'm Drima, and it's so wonderful to be with you again. Today we have a very special teacher as a guest on our program, and it's Carla Jackson Brewer. Carla has been a student of Lama Soul Trim Alione for 27 years. She's a Tara Mandala authorized teacher and has traveled with Lama Sultrim on pilgrimage to Tibet and Bali. Carla has been practicing an ancient practice for healing and transformation called Ch for 26 years and has assisted Lama Sultrim on many Ch retreats. Carla is a founder of Sinek Fanon Allies in Healing and Integrative Therapy Practice in New York City, and she's an adjunct professor in the Women's and Gender Studies Department and the Africana Studies Department at Rutgers, the State University. Carla is a public speaking coach, an emotional intelligence coach, and a consultant for the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. We are so, so happy that Carla is with us today. And before I turn it over to Carla, I'd like to share a few reminders for our time together today. So please um, take a moment to become present together and to warmly welcome our guest today by sharing where you are connecting with us from, as it's always such a joyful moment. There is also a number of people who can be with us live at this time and watching the video afterwards. So hello, you. Thank you for showing up. We are thinking of you too. Um, at the end of our gathering, you will have the opportunity to offer Dana uh, to Carla Jackson Brewer, and I will talk more about it toward the end of this meeting. Um, now, I, I would like to invite you to join some upcoming programs being held by Tara Mandela. Uh, so please be sure to join our mailing list to stay informed about our offerings, because some of them are just amazing and very rare. There is a very special upcoming virtual retreat, Dento Chigma Chud, the method for accomplishment on one seat that will take place from June 4th to 8th. And uh, it will be uh, held by Magyu Lopon Charlotte Rotterdam and Peter Ustazen. They first received this practice from Lama Wang during Poche many years ago during a wintry week at Taramandala in Colorado. And Lama Wangdu's radiant heart and infectious joy inspired them as they dove deeply into the potent visualizations, moving melodies, and awakening drum rhythms of this powerful and unique chud practice. This practice, which combines traditional chud elements with guru yoga, is the main sadhana within the Rinchen Trengwa, Precious Garland, a collection that originated with the 11th century Tibetan yogini Machik Lamchen. Since it's rarely taught, this is a special opportunity to learn this key practice, which Lama Sultrin calls the absolute core of Machik's lineage. And I am also very happy to announce that our inaugural Magyu Biennial Gathering and honoring of the mother lineage will be offered this August on the land at Taramandala, this special retreat will provide a long-awaited opportunity to connect in person with our cherished Sangha and to dive deeply into the teachings of Machik Labdran while immersing ourselves in the natural beauty of the surrounding uh, environment. 
And in this retreat, there will be um, Lama Sultrim participating, also La Pont Charlotte Rotterdam and Carla Jackson Brewer. And now it's my great, great pleasure to welcome Carla Jackson Brewer. May all beings benefit from this gathering with you. Thank you, Carla. Mm. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And everyone, I'm looking at people signing in. Oh my gosh, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is such an honor for me to be here with you. I'd like to begin first by just calling in collectively and acknowledging my ancestors. So just thinking and other people, if you feel so inclined to bring your own ancestors into this Lama Live conversation and meditation, feel so. And just, you know, our lineage, those that have gone before us who actually have made it possible for us to be here. So the ancestral lineage, what might be considered the bloodline, being able to acknowledge all of our teachers who have brought us to this moment. Also being able to, on some level, acknowledge perhaps all of our lifetimes that have brought us to this moment, that have allowed us to be able to be close, to touch, to be on the path, um, to really be able to connect to those energies and to manifest the causes and conditions for us to all be here in this moment today. So acknowledging those that have gone before, even those who have stumbled in their own lives or who may not have been operating out of the highest levels, we do get to just acknowledge them, right? So I'm just gonna take a moment and connect to my ancestors. And now I'd like us to raise bodhicitta, to raise our intention. And I'm sure Lama Sultram has talked about this. You can have your hands in prayer or in the one pointed mudra. And as we connect to our hearts, really raising a heartfelt motivation and intention that our time today will be a benefit to ourselves and will be a benefit to all sentient beings everywhere without one exception. Really feeling that connection. Thank you. So when I was thinking about well, what will I share? What will I, you know, what meditations will I do? For the last three days, what's been coming up for me is acknowledging how hard it is right now, how stressed many of us are right now, how much when we look into the world, we see suffering, we see negativity, the choices that people are making, hitting our hearts, hurting and harming other people. I don't know about you, but there are moments where I think I just wanna put my head under the covers. It feels like it's too much. It feels like it's too painful. And yet, as a Buddhist, as a spiritual person, I can't run away from that. So what's been coming up, that thing that kept, you know, even in my dreams, it's like, what we need is love. And how that arose for me was Stevie Wonder's song, Love's in Need of Love Today. Don't delay, send yours in right away. Hate's gone round, breaking many hearts. So this, you know, thinking about, yeah, how do I maintain compassion? How do I manifest a loving energy when all I see so much suffering, when I see so much harm, when I'm experiencing things in the world that really, you know, are peaking some of my emotions that are all appropriate emotions but might get in the way or begin to block me 
on my path of meditation, on my path toward enlightenment, on my path in the, you know, Vajrayana Buddhism. And I'm thankful that I have practices that help me to dissolve and to transform some of those emotional responses that are kind they're connected to my my ego, my 3D reality, the relative reality. But there's more than that. Right? And so in Buddhism, often we talk about compassion, right? But we talk about compassion going outward. And clearly that's important. But very frequently we forget that those of us who are living, who are walking, who are working, we want to be able to hold some of that or direct some of that compassion for ourselves. And so, you know, this, this idea of manifesting a loving energy and, and it takes courage to do this. It takes courage to do this because it requires a certain kind of vulnerability, a certain kind of openness. You know, that a certain way of being with your heart, like re maybe dropping a little bit some of those ways in which we protect ourselves. And the song, Love's in Need of Love Today. And I hope, we, you know, I'm not talking about that kind of possessive love, that kind of ownership love, that kind of, you know, your mind love. Really, I ask myself the question consciously, sometimes just in, in thoughts, how do I experience and or manifest what sometimes people call universal love, right? The love without, jerk, without judgment. And I have to say that's kind of hard because although I see myself as a loving person, there's, you know, my judgments come in. Often what I do is I, my question is, hmm, where did that come from? And take some space to interrogate it as opposed to like the initial feeling would be to push it down. So to help us dip into or to allow us maybe to dip in a little bit, I want to work with one of the four measurable practices. And I imagine that people, there are people here who know these practices, et cetera. And I like the idea when you talk about a practice being immeasurable, what does that mean? In some instances, we may not be able to count or know the impact that it has. In doing these practices, we're manifesting, raising, or riding on the trust that our individual practice has power in the world. It, when we practice, it is impacting all sentient beings. These practices are immeasurable because they also push us to go beyond or to push through our edge, push through our limitations, right? So I can say, yes, it's easy for me to love people that I like, to love my family members, etc. But people who I don't like or who have harmed me or irritate me, that becomes more of a challenge. So I like to think, oh, yes, I could do that. But in reality, I have to work on that. And the four measurable practices help me do that because they are helping me to not only have a wish, but to begin to manifest an aspiration for myself and other people. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to move into a little practice. And I just want to do a little loving kindness practice for ourselves and for others and before I do that, I want to do to read the prayer requests. I also at this time want to th give thanks 
my name was on the prayer requests. Um, and I want to thank publicly everyone for all of their prayers. I went through a major health crisis and I am really happy to be here to be able to share this Sunday, this powerful lunar full moon eclipse Sunday with all of you. The prayer requests for today, May 15th, 2022. David Boaz, Copper Mountain Institute, Corrales, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Conchitato, Galicia, Spain. Amelia Ochoa, Zola Aguilar, Elena Alvarez, Puerto and Eduardo Perez, Adrian Arias, Madrid, Spain. Jeanette Kingman, Johannesburg, South Africa. Helenka Skmi, Pulavi, Poland. And if I mispronounced anyone's name, please forgive me. And this is a moment for everyone also. If there are people who haven't gotten on this list, people in your family, your friends, your neighborhood, your region, that you want to bring into this practice today, just feel free in this moment to think about them, to call them into your mind's eye. And there's a moment in our practice when we'll be sending them energy. And so now as we sit, Sitting in, really presence yourself. Take a few moments, just presence yourself on your cushion or your chair or wherever you're seating. And you can focus a little bit on your breath. Nice, deep, easy inhales. Real full, relaxed exhale. Bringing in the breath and allowing the breath to ride out. And just follow your breath for a few moments. And we'll be breathing pra through this practice. So our loving kindness today practice, and there are many, many different ways that this is done. There are different phrases that are used. We start with ourselves. And I'll just recite the phrase and you can recite it to yourself after I do. And we'll say each one three times. May I be happy. May I have the causes of happiness. May I feel connected and calm. May I be healthy. May I be safe and experience peace. May I be happy. May I have the causes of happiness.
May I feel connected and calm. May I be healthy. May I be safe and experience peace. May I be happy. May I have the causes of happiness. May I feel connected and calm. May I be healthy. May I be safe and experience peace. May I be happy. May I have the causes of happiness. May I feel connected and calm. May I be healthy. May I be safe and experience peace. As you continue to breathe easily, naturally, see if you can feel the energy of these statements flowing around you, dropping into your hearts. And now we're going to send this energy. We're going to work with these statements, but it will be, may you be happy. Think of someone who you care about. Someone who might be easy to love, easy to send this energy. And we'll again, recite the statements. And as you do, see that person feeling happy, experiencing the causes of happiness, sending that and that energy of feeling connected and calm without holding back. And again, you can repeat the phrases. May you be happy. May you have the causes of happiness. May you feel connected and calm. May you be healthy. May you be safe and experience peace. May you be happy. May you have the causes of happiness. May you feel connected and calm. May 
may you be healthy. May you be safe and experience peace. May you be happy. May you have the causes of happiness. May you feel connected and calm. May you be healthy. May you be safe and experience peace. And now we're going to have the opportunity to send this loving kindness to someone who causes difficulty for us. Someone who we experience as negative or who's been hurtful, or who might even be creating great harm in their lives in the world. Without holding back, send them loving kindness. May you be happy. May you have the causes of happiness. May you feel connected and calm. May you be healthy. May you be safe and experience peace. May you be happy. May you have the causes of happiness. May you feel connected and calm. May you be healthy. May you be safe and experience peace. May you be happy. May you have the causes of happiness. May you feel connected and calm. May you be healthy. May you be safe and experience peace. And maybe take a couple of breaths here, allowing the loving kindness to flow through you from your awakened mind heart to yourself to those you feel close to, and to those you might have difficulty with. And now we'll do it just one more time, one more set. And we're just going to jump right to the whole world, anyone who's suffering. May you be happy. May you all have the causes of happiness. 
May you feel connected and calm. May you be healthy. May you be safe and experience peace. May you be happy. May you have the causes of happiness. May you feel connected and calm. May you be healthy. May you be safe and experience peace. May you be happy. May you have the causes of happiness. May you feel connected and calm. May you be healthy. May you be safe and experience peace. And again, bringing your awareness to your breath, that you're breathing. Knowing that our practice impacts all sentient beings everywhere. Let's just close this practice session with a dedication, connecting again to your heart and really holding that if any merit was gained, any benefit gained through this practice of metta loving kindness, may that benefit be shared with all beings everywhere in all the universes without one exception. Amaho. Thank you. And of course, there are so many different ways to work with this practice. I find that coming back to this practice helps me when I feel like I'm in a knot, where I feel like I don't have anything to give. I have nothing to offer. When I feel like, why bother? If I feel constricted and tight, the breath and just some loving kindness. It's so powerful, as are so many of our practices. And sometimes it's so difficult. And yet, really being able to offer loving kindness without holding back is an act of courage and builds our capacity and our capacity for compassion. Thank you all of you who are present. So maybe now might be a good time to spend some time with some questions. I know that people can type some questions in, but I do have some questions. And there was a question that came in that was talking about Tantra, the meaning of the word Tantra, continuity. What does that continuity refer to? So as in the question, the Sanskrit word Tantra means continuum or continuity or stream. 
sometimes it's explained as the continuum of the ultimate nature of all things, the ultimate nature of mind, of phenomena, that remains without interruption from the condition of sentient beings until we attain enlightenment. So sometimes I think of Tantra as the continuum of luminosity of the absolute realm. The So there's relative truth and absolute truth, and I'm sure that Lama has taught on this and she may teach more about it, but the absolute realm is how things really are. And so, you know, in my life, I'm spending a lot of time in the relative realm, the three-dimensional realm, room by the rules of, you know, gravity and science, et cetera. Um, so I could be deluded, certainly in dualistic thought, to think that the, the car that I see, that the person that's there, that they are different from me. They are other from me. They are concrete. They are independent. They are, and in fact, if we could drop into the absolute realm or lean in or experience, what would we experience? We would experience a world that is luminous, that is light-based, that is, you know, it's, the, it's when Buddhist teachings talk about life is like a dream. It's like this is a reflection, you know, that we are creating a lot of things. And so Tantra is that continuum. And there are practices um, that help us to be able to recognize the true being, to recognize our true nature. Um, and so, and that there are skillful means that often the skillful means associated with tantric practices sometimes confuse people in terms of what tantra actually is. So it's a continuum, right? Of that luminosity, the continuum of how things really are. And our practices hopefully are helping us to be able to more and more recognize how things are. And in practice, when we meditate, being able to recognize or drop in to the ground of being, to how things really are. Wow. So maybe Lama will do another, you know, a more advanced or more detailed teaching on Tantra. Um, I think that would be probably good for folks. Another question is uh, in reference to Sagadawa, which is getting close, and rec asking what kinds of practice do does one do during the month? Well, one, it's good to practice daily in general, but during Sagadawa, it's really, really good, you know, um, to practice. And what practices you do or practices I would think that are your core practices or practices that you are, that touch you, that move you, that you're connected to. There might be some specific recommendations, but I always go with, you know, what practice, you know, what really feels like it's connecting to my, my heart. Um, and so any practice you do, you could do shamatha, you could do metta, you could do tonglen, you could do vajrayana practices. Um, and I think during Sagadawa, it may be helpful for us to also not only, in addition to practicing, to maybe have a little more mindfulness or consciousness about how we are functioning in the world, right? How we are experiencing other people. Um, even very gently noticing when what I, there is what I call kind of slippage. I'm a Buddhist and I practice and, you know, I try to be kind 
But there are moments in my daily life when I'm not. Sad to say. Um, there are. There are moments when I say things like, oh, this is not right speech. So to be able to have more awareness of mm, slipped up there and to not berate myself or punish myself, just do better the next time. And Sagadawa, you know, our practices, the benefit is manifested. So I would suggest whatever practice really calls to you and you want to work with, practice. Walking meditation, practice. There's a question. How important is body work, such as somatic work, with our dharma practices? When I think about, so I think about body, speech, and mind. I think about, you know, the integration of mind, body, spirit. And, you know, what we know from science and our own lives there's a lot that we carry in our bodies and practice. Definitely every time we practice, particularly if we do um, deity practice where we are manifesting as Tara or as a uh, Pranya Paramita or a deity that energetically is working, you know, so it's a spiritual, powerful, energetic kind of working of our bodies but I think that also it could be beneficial to do, you know, other kind of body work. There certainly is yogic body work in Dharma practices, right? So beginning to like work with the body to maybe remove some blocks, to remove some traumas, to release so that, you know, then you can Actually, maybe it, it allows you to just release some of the tension. So I can speak for myself that, you know, doing certain kinds of somatic body work or certain work or work on my emotions releases certain tension where I'm not struggling with certain things. So um, doing work with feeding your demons, which I think works on so many levels to maybe dissolve and transform some things that might be blocking me on my path. So I don't think that there is a, um, a prescription against that and it could be beneficial. I think it's important also to pay attention to your experience, right? If you find it helpful, then you can work with it. There's a question, time check, yes. Yeah. There's a question about, is it okay to do two different practices in a meditation session? For example, to start with calm abiding meditation and then follow with Tonglen practice. I think that those kinds of practices work very well together. Sometimes, well, sometimes we're doing practices that are very specific, so you, and they may take a time. Um, so you may just work with that one. You don't want to have practice sessions where you're like um, doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that and like a smorgasbord in your practice. But for instance, there are preliminary practices like it, um, we do the nine breath purification practice to get oneself settled to be able to maybe do a longer sit or to do a guru yoga meditation, et cetera. Um, coming back to calm abiding to shamatha for some, for me has been very helpful. If I feel like a little too scattered all over, just come back to the breath. So the answer is yes, you can, then the two practices that were, you know, offered here or suggested here, go well together. Um, and, it, and in some practices, you have the components of, you know, like when you go to refuge, 
really working with the breath and and really being, you know, that that kind of preparation before the other parts of the sadhana. Um, so I think that that is acceptable. Um, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit, and then I'll look in the chat, about practicing dharma while you still have responsibilities to work, family, etc. And this question came in from um, someone who wants to practice dharma, um, who really wants to turn away from worldly things and is a single parent. So as many of us might know, you know, parenting has its demands, its requirements. Um, and if you're doing it on your own, certainly you're juggling so many things, right? It's stressful. Um, sometimes it's even hard to find time to practice or to have uninterrupted time, right? Um, I remember when my children were younger, I had to learn to practice with their interruptions. Um, and to not be too frustrated. And that was a practice in and of itself. Um, so in terms of, you know, the level of frustration and, and the, uh, you know, the wish to be able to have more time, I think about how Sangha is, can be so important and so beneficial and so helpful that, Sangha can help to support us to, you know, and I don't mean just spiritual Sangha, but networks of support, friends, sister circles, um, really being able to have community that supports us in our, in our lives first and then supports us in being able to practice our spirituality, to move, to, move, um, to move along the path. And I think some of it is, you know, like when you have a desire and it's difficult to fulfill that desire, I think there are lots of emotional reactions that come up. Using feeding your demons, to be able to feed, to transform those so that there's, there's less resentment. And I have to say, as a parent, I have experienced resentment. Um, and some of that has kind of been directed at my kids. Um, and then having to work with that because they didn't ask for that. So in some ways, if the best I can do is to practice within my capacity, my capacity of time or my capacity of energy, then finding a way to trust that that ultimately is beneficial. Beneficial to me, beneficial to my family. Um, and we do the best we can we do the best we can with community or support. We might be able to then, you know, have somebody take our kids for a play date or, you know, watch them overnight, um, a sleepover, um, so that I get a moment to be able to meet that needs. Um, Here's a question related. If I could release my frustration, which is silly, but it is, it's a human reaction when children interrupt you and a home retreat. Right, right. Um, who was it? I think it was Namkai Norbu Rinpoche who was in a teaching, he was giving a teaching at one point, And this really stuck with me. He was talking about, you know, this, this energy of contemplation. Right? 
So if I'm practicing and I can get to a place and I'm interrupted, can I still off the mat, off the cushion, hold, even if it's just slightly, the, uh, uh, I'll call it an attitude, but that may not really be the best word, of contemplation, or it might be ease, that ultimately all our life is practice, right? So if everything is practice, even though we have a specific sadhana that requires certain, you know, maybe mantras, etc. When I complete it, or even if it's interrupted, when I get up off my seat, can I hold that post-meditation energy? When I answer the door for a delivery, or if I get up in the middle of my practice to give my child some juice or, you know, the, give some crayons or I have to listen to them tell me something. So this is for me, you know, actually I think about how many times my practice was interrupted. So a lot of my practice was get back to practice. You know, it's like, okay, my practice session is interrupted. I get back, go back to practice. And to just like dissolve the resentment. Because in fact, if we're working with Vajra, then it's all practice. When I'm cutting vegetables or prepping dinner, it's practice. Um, when I'm speaking on the phone, when I'm working, um, it's all so that if we begin to see, so that's like thinking about in a way the continuum, right? Um, and I think also to, you know, to be kind to ourselves. That if we sit to practice and our session gets interrupted, to know, really, to hope that we'll come back. And that the benefits of what we've done will benefit all sentient beings. And yes, our action, our practice is to complete the sadhana, to complete the practice. But living in the world, I won't say but, and living in the world, living with a family, there are going to be interruptions. I mean, I can share this. I can think of, I think about last year, my mother, who was 92, was in her process of transitioning. Um, and so we were, you know, my siblings and I, we were caring for her. And I would take my practices with me and it would never fail. I would, you know, she might be settled down for the night. I think she's sleeping. I'd start my practice and then I'd hear her call me because she needed some assistance, right? Eh? So I had to pause, assist her, and be sure to come back. Because sometimes I get distracted, right? But it's to come back to practice to complete and to not be annoyed, irritated, angry, like ugh, the minute I sat down, she started to almost sort of be able to chuckle and then to take it into the practice. Um, and that just, that just takes practice to be able to do that. Um, And when frustrations arise, offer yourself a little loving kindness. That can really be helpful. I want to see if there are any other questions. Uh, Just a final thought. For me, I keep looking at how my practice does benefit the world. How does my practice benefit my family? How does my practice to like really, and part of 
I guess it could be a prayer, but I don't really articulate it with words, is kind of like this faith that every moment, every time I practice, the energy of my practice goes out into the world. I want to see the benefit. But that also requires me to have the courage to walk with compassion. So I think it's Bell Hooks who talked recently in one of her books about how love, love is an action, right? Compassion is an action. So being able to ask myself, well, hmm, what actions have I taken today, this week, that demonstrate that? Because I can say I love you, you know, and smile, and maybe you feel some warmth. Um, but I may be put to a moment of really acting you know, going beyond those. So the words are important, but going beyond the words, like, all right. And really recognizing, was I unkind in that moment? Yes, I was. Oops. Um, and then to have a process of, you know, next time I do better. And even thinking about, like, what does compassion look like? Maybe compassion looks like when I'm in a store and I'm talking to a cashier, I just ask them, how's your day going? I look them in the eye when I speak to them. Or compassion might be that I listen to this story that my child just told me over and over and over again. And I'm kind of like, mm, I don't really want to hear this. <laughs> Get to the punchline. And it's like, no, just listen. Or maybe it might be that I find a moment where I don't take personally someone else's rudeness or coldness or nastiness. Maybe compassion is that I push to be able to send loving kindness to those people who I might call or classify as evil. And that's not an easy thing. So, you know, maybe compassion is that I spend some time really listening to other people and listening to their experiences. Because that's going to help me to really be more understanding and compassionate in the world. Hmm. So I have to tell you, Stevie Wonder is like in my mind, you know, love's in need of love today. Don't delay, send yours in right away. So maybe for the rest of the evening or the day or the morning, whatever time zone you're in, maybe every a little now and then you just kind of focus on your heart chakra. And maybe it's open as, as much as it can be open. Somebody says when you are drained, ah, oh, that's good. When you're really feeling drained, then, then more loving kindness to you. I would do meta practice. It's almost like taking a bath in love and compassion, an energetic bath, just to, and also, I think if you feel drained, maybe the action is, and this is in the relative world, take some time, take some space. Be kind to you. Do something sweet to you. Even if it's just five minutes, 10 minutes in the moment. It might be that in those 10 minutes, you plan a little other time for renewal. And that may come through just, that might come through practice. So 
So we are at the end of our time. I want to thank you all for being here. And thank you for allowing me to share some of my thoughts on Lama Live. Um, as was announced, I will be at Tara Mandala in August at the Magu Gathering. Um, and I hold a couple of practices with the New York Sangha. Um, twice a month on Monday nights, we do Dakini Mandala. I also, for all of you Chumas and Chupas, now that I'm feeling better, in June, I think I will schedule a CHI practice, um, online practice, which I'll announce in the networks, I guess. And thank you again. Jeremy, do I now turn it over to you? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. It's so, so special to connect with you on our journey and you know, how you open us, how you inspire us and teach us how to be kind to ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as Rita wrote in the chat, thank you for such valuable gifts of wisdom. May you be healthy. May you be safe and experience peace. May you be happy. May you have the causes of happiness. May you feel connected and calm. Dear audience, although we can't really see you, we do feel your presence. And it's such a joy that we can cultivate kindness, compassion, and spaciousness together in this unique way. I have the pleasure of inviting you to the next two Lama Life events, um, just next Sunday on the May 22nd. Our guest teachers will be Magi Lopon Charlotte Rotterdam and Peter Ustazen. So join us live if you can. It's always so powerful with these beautiful teachers. And on the uh, last Sunday of May, on the 29th May, Lama Sultrim will be joined by Bob Thurman, known in the academic circles as Professor Robert Thurman. So uh, Mr. Thurman is a popularizer, popularizer sorry, of the Buddha's teachings and the first Westerner Tibetan Buddhist monk ordained by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. At this point, I want to remind you that you can make a Dana offering to Carla Jackson Brewer if you would like to make an auspicious connection. Dharma teachings are traditionally offered on the basis of Dana, which is offered to a teacher in recognition of the precious gift that has been given. So much gratitude flowing to you, Carla, for today. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us. May we meet again and again on the path. May all beings benefit everywhere. Om tare tu tare tu e Mangalam shi mahapani swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Mangalam Shri Mahapani Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Mangalam Shri Mahapani Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu